So we've heard from the Air Force, we've heard about the Navy, we've heard about the Army and the Corps of Engineers. The day would not be complete, complete without hearing from our friends at NASA who are living on the, the front lines of sea level rise. So we're very happy today to have with us Director William Robel. He's the director of the, William, the, the Wallops Flight Facility at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center out on Wallops Island. And he began his career in 1982 with McDonnell Douglas on the Delta Launch Vehicle Program. While there, he worked on a variety of proprietary spacecraft programs, and then he went on to Orbital Sciences Corporation, where he also worked on a variety of programs before joining NASA headquarters in 2006. In 2010, he became the director of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center's Wallops Flight Facility, where he also serves as the director of suborbital and special orbital projects, and is responsible for Goddard Space Flight Center's suborbital and low-cost orbital flight projects. He is a recipient of NASA's Agency Honor Outstanding Leadership Medal in 2015, as well as various Goddard Space Flight Center awards. I have to say, a whole day of reading these introductions is just making me feel bad. <laughs> All these awards and publications. So we're very happy to welcome Director Wilbur. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Happy to be here. All right, great. Hey, good afternoon. Um, so uh, what I've got here is a few slides that just will give you a little bit of an overview of, of wallops and you kind of get a, a lay of the land, just at least see where we are. Um, I know that some of you uh, here have, have been up there. Uh, hopefully others of you will m make the trek at some point. Uh, it, it, it's one of the neatest places I've uh, ever had the pleasure to work. Um, so uh, the photo here really is the island. It's a barrier island. Uh, it encompasses about I don't know, seven miles or so of, of overall coastline. Um, and it's about 3,000 acres, kind of including what is, you can kind of see there in the island, and then kind of the back marsh areas. And then we have, uh, joined by Causeway, what we call the, the mainland portion. And uh, that's where we keep uh, some things that are maybe at a little bit higher elevation uh, than those right along the coast uh, there. So with that, I'll get into a little bit about uh, WALPS kind of by the numbers. Uh, our annual budget is about $250 million. Uh, our economic impact uh, kind of nationwide is $802 uh, million, about 5,700 uh, jobs kind of US-wide. It's uh, roughly $1.2 billion in assets uh, on the island, a uh, combination of, of NASA facilities, uh, Navy facilities, uh, Commonwealth of Virginia, Virginia Spaceport, uh, is there as well. We have uh, about 280 uh, civil servants uh, on the NASA side of things and then followed by another 800 uh, contract uh, folks. We've got uh, tenant personnel uh, also, as I kind of mentioned with uh, NOAA and uh, Navy, uh, as well as Virginia Space and the Coast Guard. Uh, we've got uh, some of the, their housing up there. So, uh, so basically that's um, kind of uh, overall just what we look like uh, kind of just numbers wise. Um, and then what we do. So uh, we provide a series of platforms to anyone uh, within the agency certainly, but also uh, those outside. Uh, so other uh, government entities, uh, and then obviously since NASA's uh, always trying to kind of promote uh, the commercial side of things, we're doing a lot with commercial industry as well. Uh, the primary work that we do is um, Sounding rockets, which you can kind of see in the larger photo there. Uh, balloons, scientific balloons. Uh, probably the biggest education I had in going to Wallops was the balloon side of things. I'd always been kind of a user of them uh, from a weather standpoint, but those were kind of the latex balloons. And the balloon you're looking at there is, um, most of it is, is not visible, believe it or not, in the photo. Uh, said another way, you can put almost the better part of 300 Goodyear blimps on the inside of one of these things when they're fully inflated. So they're, they're quite large. Uh, and, then, and then aircraft, uh, heavy lift aircraft uh, for a lot of the earth science missions that we do kind of globally. Um, we're one of four launch range, ranges in the United States. Uh, so it's one of four places in the US uh, where you can actually uh, go, go to orbit. Uh, primarily, uh, as of late, it's certainly been uh, relative to the International Space Station and doing resupply services. Um, next big mission for us uh, is November 11th at about 7.30 in the morning. It's, it is a Saturday for those of you that are interested maybe in coming up. 
it's an invitation. Um, uh, and what you're looking at there is, uh, is the uh, spaceport uh, put in place by the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, it's the second of two kind of major installations they have uh, put in place there over the last, say, uh, 20 years. Um, so our, our approach to kind of the coastal resilience uh, side of things has been that we're right now only, I mean, some of it goes way back into the 40s. So the, as was mentioned just in the last discussion, uh, you know, the place is 75 years old or thereabouts. Um, so there is some, some older structures that are in place. Uh, but as of the last uh, couple decades or so, pretty much anything that we put on the island it has to be there. In other words, if, if it can be located onto the mainland portion or up on the main base, uh, especially with a lot of the technological advances like uh, fiber optic cable and some of those things, it's allowed us to move some of those uh, older items that were connected by copper and the distances really made a great difference in, in how the data was collected. So since we've kind of uh, been able to improve that along the way, we've been able to move some of that stuff up off the island. Um, and then obviously any of the critical infrastructure that we are putting on the island now, uh, we're setting up to be 11 feet uh, above mean sea level. And then uh, the last aspect of it is shoreline protection. Uh, we went through a, a, a big um, uh, improvement to the shoreline uh, with a lot of help from uh, Army Corps of Engineers here, uh, which basically handled kind of that, that aspect of things for us. Uh, we did uh, just ahead of Sandy, and, and I've got some more of that uh, coming up here in a few minutes. Two pads you're looking at right there are, are kind of at the south end, not at the very end of the island, but it's the southernmost uh, portion that we're kind of using for some of the large launch areas. And then as you move up the island, we've got other facilities uh, on up. Um, so this gives you a, a better look at it uh, from one end to the other. Um, down in the lower portion of the picture, you see an old uh, UAS runway, uh, unmanned aerial systems. And uh, we've got, got a newer one that we've built at the north end. You can kind of see a little bit of, of how the island is shaped and maybe where uh, a fair amount of the erosion seems to be uh, uh, re really taking hold at the south end of the island. So uh, basically with um, a lot of help from the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, we basically put in 3.2 million cubic yards of sand here in the last, uh, say, five years. Uh, in addition to kind of expanding the beach, we also had a, a, a pretty severe undercut, uh, which they also kind of um, uh, smoothed out quite a bit. So there was another 200 feet that's uh, subaqueous, as, as mentioned here, um, th to kind of dampen that out. So it wasn't such a big drop off. We were seeing a lot, a lot more of the, uh, the erosion as a result of that. Um, so you're looking at 19,600 feet of coastline. Um, it was a $40 million investment. I think it's the first one serious investment uh, at the facility since probably the, uh, say, early 80s, early to mid 80s. Um, and it's protecting, again, uh, $1.2 uh, billion worth of assets. Uh, so that's partially why we can uh, kind of are doing this. Um, so relative to what has uh, taken place here recently, a couple of hurricanes, um, Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy, uh, these were actually pretty comparable storms from an intensity standpoint. Um, and you can kind of see the dates there, August 2011, October 2012, max winds 62 versus 68, total rain 6.6 uh, .6 versus 8.5. Um, and then from the Wachaprig uh, area, uh, 8.4 feet uh, mean low water uh, versus 8.4. And then we had about four feet of storm surge. Uh, so this, they were they were pretty similar relative to kind of that uh, that test. Um, the big difference is is that just ahead of Sandy, we had just finished uh, a, that pretty major restoration of the beach, and uh, fortunately we did, um, because this is what uh, Irene looked like, uh, basically as uh, part of some of the security cameras down on the island. Uh, and the preparations that we do in advance of, of these storms. We put a lot of things in place, but you can see there's a lot of water uh, overwashing. Certainly the seawall was breached in a number of areas. Um, power was out uh, basically with a lot of the sand that was pushed into place. 
while it says we were out for several days, it was better part of two weeks before we really had things kind of back up and running. Um, so we got hit pretty good with that one. Um, and then if you look at Sandy, uh, again, kind of relative and sim similar intensities, um, we didn't have to take down the power. Uh, we did not breach anywhere. Um, we didn't have any significant flooding uh, of anything. We were back to work the next day. So it, it, was, a, it was a huge difference. Uh, in fact, at that point, we were trying to get uh, one of the first Antares missions off to the space station. It was literally uh, left on the pad. So um, quite, a, quite a difference there. Um, so post-Hurricane Sandy, we lost about 20% of the beach. Um, we did get uh, a Sandy supplemental of about $11.3 million uh, for an out-of-cycle renourishment. Uh, also, uh, you know, thanks to the support that we get from the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, that allowed us to basically bring in another 650,000 uh, cubic yards of sand. Uh, and at, the, at present right now, we're hoping for another uh, kind of large replenishment in the 2019 timeframe. Um, you know, that's not a, a guarantee, certainly, with the way the budgets are, uh, but, but, but we certainly have gotten our uh, desires, um, you know, all the way up into NASA headquarters so that they uh, hopefully will, will think kindly of us here in the, in the next couple of years. Um, th things seem to be holding out uh, pretty well so far. I know some of the storms as of late uh, have uh, made a few more dents uh, from an erosion standpoint. Um, honestly, some of the worst storms for us seem to be the Northeasters. Uh, because of the dwell, um, you know, the number of tidal cycles, and especially if there's a full moon involved and all that, it, um, it really seems to uh, hit us pretty hard. Um, so in the last, um, say, five years or so, uh, we've, we've uh, come up with what we call the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Resilience Institute, MACRI for short, um, and that uh, involves a, a number of uh, uh, government agencies, i.e. NASA, uh, certainly us, um, William and Mary, I know, is a, is a big part of that, uh, as is uh, UVA, uh, Delaware. There's a number of uh, other entities. Um, Pennsylvania has a uh, uh, marine science consortium just outside the Wallops Gate, uh, and so that's kind of what they like as a part of their curriculum, so it's a, it's a neat way to kind of bring in that institution. Um, and as some of the scientists will point out that you know, a lot of data f relative to what uh, folks necessarily study are, are somewhat stovepiped. And so the thought here was is that we kind of aggregate all the different data systems that are out there and uh, kind of bring together such that we can maybe build a model uh, that would help kind of inform policymakers uh, in these coastal areas, um, you know, about how to, how to maybe um, adjust things uh, into the future. So the thought is, is if we can do something like that in the Wallops area that's, uh, pretty much unspoiled, right? There's not, there's not a lot of development in the area. Uh, it does get a very strong signal relative to, you know, what Mother Nature does from time to time. And so it's a great place to kind of study that. And so uh, relative to that, we have uh, had some support in uh, putting some models together. The thought is in the long run as we get better with this and as we get maybe a little bit smarter on some of the data acquisition, that perhaps this is a, uh, something that we could put in place in other areas around the country so, such as to inform policymakers in those locales uh, for the same kinds of things. Uh, this was uh, relative to uh, some work that the governor uh, had sponsored some um, uh, funding uh, out, out there for some of the universities to basically get some of this in place. And we had a neat uh, kind of opening event uh, for that uh, here in the last uh, few months. So um, my last uh, slide here is, is uh, just kind of relative to um, the probability of shore erosion. Uh, as you can kind of see, that we, we're in that uh, red area there right along the coast. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's very active. Um, and so we, we see, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of uh, desire to maybe kind of continue some of the work that we're doing in that area. Uh, we know we're going to see it uh, pretty much all the time. And so we're uh, obviously through a couple of things, we're, t we're taking, um, you know, approaches to to trying to stay above uh, the sea level rise, and then uh, with what we're getting from the core, uh, we hope to go into a replenishment cycle here in the 2019 timeframe and, and kind of continue things on. Um, so we're uh, obviously moving anything that we can that isn't necessary to be on the island off, but obviously some of the, uh, the harder things like launch pads and some of those things from a safety standpoint, they, they really do need to be along the coast. 
And so we're trying to relegate it just to those, uh, those things. So with that, I'll stop and, and uh, I can take any questions or um, happy to maybe give you some time back as well. No? Yes, ma'am. You noted in one of your slides that there's uh, no critical infrastructure there below 11 feet above mean. Well, there, is there is. However, anything new, we're right. Right. So, how much does that encompass your roadways into the facility? Yeah. So, uh, fortunately, the main causeway coming in is uh, actually quite high. They had done that uh, back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s time frame. Um, the, the roads on the island are. Um, fairly low and we have had uh, some flooding in areas but has not been too bad as, as kind of shown in the photos it seems like as long as the seawall seems to be okay then we don't really see anything significant uh, thankfully um, and if the replenishment cycles kind of come in that say five to seven year time frame you know the hope it is, is that it, it'll be or it'll be okay and how did you all pick 11 feet as your uh, it was a combination of uh, what the uh, core had, had looked at as to kind of what they thought maybe was worst case and then as uh, as engineers you know we always like to have a little margin on top of that and so that's it was really just one of those things that we picked we picked we like hearing about a margin of safety that's good we like that yeah. we like that yeah did anyone else have questions over here let's project what, what's the difference between uh, macri and the odu vims uh, Commonwealth Center for Current Flooding Resiliency, or is there a relationship there? Yeah, so I'd say it's the it's the relationship there. Vims is a is a is a part of uh, of kind of what we're doing overall, and so um, it, they've got some awesome expertise, and so we like to tap into that, and that's that's really how it plays out. I can speak to the second half of that there question. <laughs> so the Commonwealth Center for Recurrent Flooding Resiliency was created by uh, legislation that was submitted by Delegate Stolly. We may be still out in the hall, but let's give him a shout out. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a partnership between Old Dominion University and VIMS and the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. And so that's at the state level, bringing together the institutions and leveraging resources and enabling us to do some research and provide tools to people trying to deal with recurrent flooding. So that's at the state level versus MACRI, as right. we just addressed. Yeah. It's just opened up a little bit more, I guess, is right. the only difference. Right. Yeah. So uh, you described, uh, well, I'll back up a little bit. We've mentioned a couple times in conversations today the military bases. We, we've learned not to think of them as islands. In your case, I guess you do. <laughs> and what you described uh, in terms of building your resilience largely was in your own control, things that you could do to make sure that you're going to be uh, able to continue to operate. I wonder if there are dependencies that come to mind that you share or interact with the local community, uh, maybe even including the Virginia Space Center that are important. Yeah, I, I'd say that uh, kind of just relative to our locale uh, with the folks that are, that are on the facility, uh, certainly we have uh, regular interaction. So anything new that we would put up or they would put up or, if, or the Navy, uh, obviously all that is uh, kind of discussed before um, kind of the actual uh, drawings maybe would come out relative to how they would how they would go ahead and build so that part of it is probably a lot more straightforward since we're all kind of in, involved we're all on the same island essentially mm -hmm. uh, relative to the rest of the community um, I'd, I'd say that uh, certainly just by virtue of the fact that a lot of the folks that are part of the community also work uh, at the facility um, there's some of that that goes back and forth uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, which is Assateague, is a part of, uh, of this uh, group that I've mentioned relative to Macri. And so uh, the hope, hope is, right, we continue to kind of disseminate that information, um, you know, as we get smarter about the whole thing overall. And so uh, as a result of kind of the partners that we have as, as a part of Macri, uh, we think that that does, does all that. I was curious about the um, kind of the, the uh, having uh, sand placement as one of the core resilience uh, measures, and your thought about doing that into the future. I know it's very costly; it's not very cost-effective compared to some nature-based solutions. So I just wondered if NASA and um, your group has looked into um, other options. And I know the Dutch are trying to think 
think this through and have done a few case studies where they just plop a bunch of sand sort of um, north of where they want it to go and then they're modeling to see you know, if that's one option of, of maybe do, using sand um, in a different way. So I just wanted to hear about some of your thinking around um, your resilience in the future as far as sand is. So, so I'm not going to try to put the uh, Army Corps on, on, uh, on the spot here necessarily, but, but I mean, we're, we're kind of partnered in this going forward. And so maybe I can let you comment to that to a certain extent as well. It's certainly part of the, the thing to uh, sign and, and we do a lot. The question was also asked regarding what we do with Assateague and some of the other folks on the shore. Certainly investigating uh, other ways, but as shown here, there's been some success with the replenishment and what we've done, but certainly trying to think through ways to be more cost effective, ways to take advantage of what we're learning about natural and nature-based features. We also have some things we've done actually with Erdic in terms of the way uh, sediment, yeah. you know, and, and, and movement and understanding uh, that. So I think that early in, in terms of incorporating that at Wallops, uh, because right now we're on the replenishment cycle, uh, and, and that has seemed to work. But I think we're not opposed and certainly continue to investigate other ways to be wiser with the dollars that we actually get. not hearing anybody mention that this is a barrier island, right? It is and a barrier island. And so the island. sand moves. Mm -hmm. So the sand is coming where other people are losing their sand, and then it's supposed to leave where you are and go down and replenish. So, I mean, is there a point of no return where you say, okay? Uh, I would say there, there may be. Um, it may, maybe the right way to answer is we haven't uh, maybe gotten there yet. Uh, relative to that. In fact, um, it, you can comment on this too. We're actually seeing um, we're actually seeing some growth at the kind of the north end of the island, which is which is kind of interesting. Uh, a fair amount of it, actually, even just in the few short years I've been there, it's it's been an amazing. It is, but that's a whole other yep. discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I think, sir, your, your comment is correct. That we just we haven't gotten uh, to that yet. I think this is continuing to develop and, and is certainly a space where we need to spend more time and better understand. Yeah. But we remain, I mean, John Yoko, there are a lot of folks, on, you know, ask Steve Washburn, that we remain in communication with. So I think we're back to collaboration and being smart about how we proceed being mindful of, of what we're trying to do, which is what today is all about. All right. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate yep. it. Thank you.